today's video, we'll be looking at some tasteful upgrades for the Amiga 2000. So when I talk about tasteful upgrades for the Amiga 2000, what do I mean exactly? I guess I can best explain that by uh, telling you about a quick conversation I had with a uh, gentleman that actually works on Amigas all the time, was storing them and recapping them. And, um, you know, he's very familiar with the Amigas and um, the architecture. And uh, he was kind of making a joke with me. He said, what's the first thing someone does these days when they buy an Amiga? They spend a bunch of money on their fancy uh, Amiga. And the first thing they do is it is they slap in an accelerator. They slap in, like, a ludicrous amounts of memory. Uh, they slap in, like, a, a analog RGB to HDMI converter so they can display it on a uh, widescreen. LCD, something like that, and it's, it's kind of like it gets to the point where it's just, you kind of lose the thing you originally wanted. Now I'm not beating up on anyone that does that or saying that's wrong or anything like that. Uh, I personally, I don't get it personally, I'm a, I'm a little bit, I'm not a complete hardware purist, but uh, I guess you could consider me a hardware purist for the most part, although I do make compromises and exceptions. Uh, for instance, you know, I have the floppy emulator there. I do make uh, compromises, but uh, with my machine, I'd like to keep the heart and soul of it intact. And I just, I, I just think, uh, especially with the Amiga 2000, what I've been seeing lately in the Amiga community, the upgrades can get out of hand. Um, and it, it, I mean, you get an Amiga because you like Amiga, and then you basically replace the CPU with a Raspberry Pi, and you start outputting HDMI, and it's just like, there's nothing wrong with that, but it gets to the point where it feels like it's not really an Amiga anymore. It's you're, you're basically running an Amiga emulator in an Amiga case. At that point, you may as well just play it on a, your your main modern PC. It's just. In my opinion, it gets to be a bit much. And I don't want to come off as too much of a hypocrite here, because I've kind of done similar things in the past, uh, but usually it's kind of a side project, or it's something that could have been done with that machine more or less in the era. I mean, I have made ridiculously overpowered DOS computers like DOSzilla. Uh, I've taken 46s and maxed the RAM and, you know, put in uh, more pretty powerful CPUs, but... Uh, these things were more or less available at the time. When I, what I'm talking about with the Amiga is, it's almost like it gets turned into something that just couldn't exist. Like, there's a difference between replacing like a 46 with maybe a 5x86 or, or a really like beefed up 46, and taking an Amiga with like a Motorola 68K CPU and putting in something like a vampire which is like a, a FPGA chip or something it's some of these accelerators are literally like I don't I don't know I'm just making up a number but it seems like they're hundreds of times faster and um again there's nothing wrong with that but it just I just really think that there gets to a point where um a lot of these Amigas I'm seeing, it's just, they're, it feels like they're barely Amigas anymore. It's just, it's almost like it's turned into something else. And I could do a whole video on the topic of, like, hardware purists, and specifically me, and why I like to use uh, retro, like, authentic hardware uh, when I can, things like that. I, I can make a whole video about that, but specifically speaking out the Amiga, like I said, I get it, I can, I get the fun in that, but... Um, I don't know, it's just, that is not the way I wanted to go with this. And I did want to do some upgrades just for quality of life and to increase reliability and things like that, but I didn't want to go too crazy. Again, that's why these are tasteful upgrades. Uh, so, I really wanted to keep the heart and soul of this machine. 
So first off, no messing with the video. I just wanted to output the analog RGB to a Commodore monitor. Didn't want to mess with the video. I wanted to keep the CPU intact as a Motorola uh, 68K CPU. I didn't want to go crazy with the CPU. And uh, that's the main things. I also wanted, if I could, I wanted to be able to have like switches if I could. So if I needed to revert things back to original, so if I had an accelerator, I really wanted like a switch that I could turn the accelerator on and off. That seems like a simple request, but with Amiga accelerators, that's actually a pretty rare option. Generally with the Amiga, it seems like you put in an accelerator and that's it. Like your, your Amiga is accelerated. There's, there, there's no way to like really decelerate it. Uh, maybe through some software, but there's not a lot of switches. And I'm even talking about like retro accelerators, but there are a few. Um, so they do exist. Now, I, I think the reason for that is most software on the Amiga just runs fine accelerated. It, generally, Amiga games don't go crazy when you have a super fast accelerator in there. So there wasn't really a need to have a switch to go back to like stock speeds. But it's just something I wanted in case I just wanted to run the thing uh, stock. I, I suppose it probably does help with compatibility a little bit, but that was never a huge problem with the Amiga. But um, so yeah, so in this video, we're just going to go through, we're going to look at my Amiga, and we're going to look at some of the, uh, some of the upgrades I did, and again, I wanted to do these upgrades while still keeping in the spirit uh, of the original Amiga, and I didn't want to stray too far from what is, in essence, the Amiga 2000. Well, before we start this video proper, uh, I just want to add a couple notes quickly. Um, this, like many of my videos, was done over a pretty long period of time. Uh, so the first part of this video, again, there will be footage from the old room, um, and there were some little upgrades I tried to do, like, probably over a year ago. So, uh, and then I kind of did shot this video as I had parts uh, come in. So it is a little piecemeal. It might be a little disorganized. I'm really going to try to clean it up in editing. Uh, I should probably do try to do a little bit better job with that. Um, but yeah, it may flow a little bit weird, because like I said, I did this video very piecemeal over a very long period of time. So, uh, like I said, I'll try to clean it up in editing. Um, but the first part, uh, just to clarify things, the first thing I did here is I wanted to replace that old 50 megabyte uh, hard drive that came with this machine. It was a SCSI drive, uh, 50 megabyte, so my first attempt, as you'll see, I used, uh, well, I had that card in there, the hard drive controller in there, I believe it was from JVP, and I, uh, I replaced it with one of these guys, and uh, SD to S, oh, I forget what it's called, it's like a SCSI to SD card adapter, and uh, it worked well enough. Uh, unfortunately, as you'll see, the uh, actually hard drive controller card I had in here from JVP, I think, uh, it had some compatibility issues. Uh, with some of the other cards and, and uh, modifications or upgrades I wanted to do. Um, so I ended up switching this out later on. But uh, yeah, that's what's going on here at first. Uh, also, I don't remember if I ever mentioned it, but in my original video, and of course if you haven't seen the original video I did on my Amiga 2000, uh, check it out. But I was using... Well, all I had for a keyboard was my Amiga 4000 keyboard, and I had a little adapter. Uh, but thankfully... Uh, a few months ago, I had a friend who hooked me up with this actual, authentic Amiga 2000 keyboard, and I'm very grateful for that. And, um, yeah, it's just nice to have the matching set now, the matching Amiga 2000 keyboard and Amiga 2000. So, uh, thank you uh, if you're watching this video again for the keyboard. Very grateful. It's awesome. Uh, so, uh, enjoy the video, and uh, let's take a look at some tasteful upgrades. Alright, so big update I'm going to be doing to my Amiga 2000 is finally adding a bigger, hopefully more reliable hard drive from that 50 megabyte SCSI hard drive that's probably 30 years old, 20 years old. Um, so I did acquire one of these guys. This is uh, a uh, SCSI to SD, SCSI to SD uh, card. So this connects with a standard SCSI connection and then you can use a SD card as a hard drive. This is uh, version 5.1. Uh, at this point there's later ones but they're a little more expensive and uh, this should do what I need it to do. And it came with this uh, 2 gigabyte SD card. This is for like a Raspberry Pi 
uh, label. I guess that's what this was originally for, but uh, this should work just fine as a hard drive replacement. And that's two gigabytes, and that should be more than enough um, than what I'm, uh, that should be more than enough for my needs. Uh, certainly, two gigabytes is a big upgrade from 50 megabytes. So, um, I guess we're just going to see if this works. Um, over here I have original uh, Amiga 3.1. That's what I'm going to be installing. Uh, OS 3.1. Uh, now I have no idea if these discs work. Um, or if I even have all of them. But I guess we'll see. Uh, I'm guessing if there's any hang-up with this operation, it's going to be that these discs are corrupt. Um, and at that point, I will have to find replacements. Um, I think you can get newer ones online, maybe Amiga Kit uh, or something. I don't know, but I'm going to try with these first. So we ran into a few roadblocks. Um, the first is my uh, three-point... Whoop, that's... I don't know where they are. They're over here. Uh, my 3.1 Amiga floppies, at least the install disk, was corrupt. Um, the second issue I ran into is, uh, well, I, I also have the install 3.0 disks, which are mostly the same. I think the 3.0 lacks CD-ROM support, I'm not 100% sure, and some fixes and updates. But it's, it's mostly, it's very similar, and I wanted something, uh, at least for now. Um, unfortunately, it just would not detect the uh, SD card. Um, now, fortunately, I actually had the driver disk for the uh, my uh, interface card, the SCSI controller card, and uh, it was a GVP A408, and um, you, I put this in and I ran the program and it saw the SD card. It, it, it saw this card uh, it registered the right amount. I think that this is a two gigabyte card. It saw two gigabytes, and I partitioned it. Let me partition and format it. Um, but then it gave me the option to, oh, do you want to install a flop from a floppy disk to this new partition? Um, and I put this in, and it just it wouldn't work. It would say copying, and then it would just stop. Um, it wouldn't even try to copy it, and then it would just be like, oh, do you want to copy another disk? Um, don't know why. Then I would log into the OS, and they would it would actually show up. The partitions would show up on the OS, um, but you couldn't access them. Um, you could try to run, like, HD tools and the stuff that you use on an Amiga to format and, and then install, and it just it would not see it. It wouldn't see it, and it was really frustrating. And then I remembered, um, I haven't done a review on this. It's coming. I have a PAL Amiga 600, and... Um, I haven't really messed with this thing much. Uh, it's it's really nice. It's been recapped. And at one point, I was trying to install. It uses IDE actually, and I was trying to put in a um, an SD hard drive in that. And I didn't have much luck. Uh, but I remembered when I got this little adapter, it came with a supposedly pre-set up SD card. Uh, not sure the legality of that, but I do have the discs, corrupt or not, I do have the, the discs. Um, so I was like, huh. So I dug that out, and I took that SD card out, and I put it in the um, SCSI 2 SD card, and I rebooted, and lo and behold, it booted right up into OS 3.1. Nice, so I guess we can call that a uh, success. Um, I'm not sure what the size of this is. Um, I, I also want to maybe try to add some more memory. Because if you see on this card here, it looks like there's more room to add memory. So maybe I will... Uh, I'm going to shut this down, take this out. I'm going to properly attach this and remove the old 50 megabyte. And then maybe add some more memory and uh, put it back together. And that's one more upgrade that, you know, good. Alright, so I, I don't like to mix and match memory. Uh, and types and stuff, but I only had so much I could work with, so I tried to match pairs where I could, uh, but it does appear I managed to get, well, it's, it's set for 8 megabytes, but it's a little under 8 megabytes, but that's a big memory improvement. Um, 8 megabytes is the max on this card, but I don't think it's all going to show up. Uh, some of that's probably being eaten up by the uh, OS. Um, so, okay, good, we've upgraded the memory, 
Uh, we've upgraded the hard drive. I'm going to probably zip tie this onto the card and then put it back together. Um, so, so far looking good. Big upgrade on this one. Alright, so um, hey guys, there's been a pretty big uh, time warp. So, some of the footage you were watching earlier when I was installing this card, that was actually probably like two years ago, and I just kind of never did any more with the video. Um, there were some other things I wanted to do, and it never worked out, so I just kind of let things stand as is. And to be honest, this card here with the uh, SD to, or the SCSI to SD card uh, as a hard drive has worked fine. I haven't had any issues with it. And, yeah, everything's worked fine. Well, as you guys may or may not know, I recently moved, like, maybe two months ago. And I brought the, of course, I brought the Amiga with me as one of the first computers to try to set up here. Okay, so the first mod I want to do is pretty simple. And it's one I tried to do last time and failed at. So I wanted to try again with something a little new. And that was a uh, floppy drive selector. So I want to be able to select which is the primary floppy drive to boot from, the external or the internal. And before I had a, like a switcher with a little switch, and that didn't seem to work, but I have this new auto switcher that uh, has seemed to have gotten good reviews. And this is really nice because I, I guess on the ones with the switch, you, there's a way that you might uh, short it out and you might kill your uh, CIA chip, uh, which is the, you know, the controller for the floppy drive. And uh, this guy here, that shouldn't be a thing. So basically, uh, well, I've got to do this on the even chip. One is odd and one is even. And the funny thing is, with the instructions, it tells you uh, locate the chip marked 8520A1. But on this machine, both of the chips have that marking. Um, so it's like, uh, but I, I looked it up. And I was told 301, 301, this is our even chip, hopefully. So I think this is the chip we need to uh, swap out with this. So we pull this out, and then we put it on this, and then we install it in there. And then theoretically, that's all we need to do. And then according to uh, this, uh, we hold down, well, it's on here somewhere. Uh, maybe here. We hold down the... Um, Amiga and control like we're restarting for five seconds and then I assume it will make a little noise with that piezo. This must be a newer revision because the ones I've seen online didn't have the little piezo beeper, at least that's what it looks like. And on those ones uh, they were like hitting it three times, the restart three times and then it would switch uh, whichever drive was like the default one. Uh, but it seems to be a little bit different uh, this what must be a newer revision. So. Um, I don't know. I guess we will uh, we'll find out. Okay, so we're installed. In theory, that's uh, all we need to do, so I'll just hook up uh, the GoTech to the external port, and I'll hook up the real drive here, um, you know, to the, to the main controller there, and we'll see. And another thing I was aware of, because when I did my first video, I did get some helpful tips from people about the uh, floppy drive switcher and you want to make sure this is set right so I believe if it's closed that means you have two internal drives so if it's open like it is now uh, that should allow for well it's telling it that there's one internal drive and then um, you have your uh, external drive which kind of uses its own thing so this time I'm actually using well this was a Amiga external floppy drive. There was a the top to this case and there was a drive in it. The drive was dead so I removed it and I took the top of the case off for now and I've just kind of connected this to it so uh, if I do go with this like if this works and I go with this as a permanent thing uh, I'll probably put the top back on and uh, cut a hole in it. Uh, someone else in my comments said that they did that and it's I, I do agree it's a bit more of a more elegant uh, elegant solution so uh, and here it's connected to the uh, rear floppy port so uh, let's see how this works I'll put this back I've got this guy hooked up I have a Amiga diagnostic floppy in there that I know is good working so we'll see what happens okay so far uh, I have everything set up and it didn't I have this now set 
as the uh, primary drive, the external uh, as the primary. And I have sort of Sodan on there. And it did not boot into the game. It booted, it tried, it made some sounds, and then it booted into the hard drive. And, but as you can see, it is detecting the game, uh, Sedan 1, Disk 1. But when I click on it to see the contents, there's just nothing in there. Uh, so there's no icon to click to start the game. But let's go back. Now, if I change this to, say, Workbench uh, version 1, and then we go back over to the screen, give it a moment. And there it is. Da, da, da. Well, extra is 1.3. So it is detecting that. And it's seeing things on there. So let me see. Um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not really sure what's going on. Let me see, though, if it will actually uh, possibly boot into the uh, workbench disk. Okay. And it did not, so although it's detecting it, it just doesn't seem like it will boot from anything on that uh, external floppy drive connector. Uh, it just doesn't seem to be working correctly. Now let me see if I can set this guy right here as the main, uh, main thing. So, so I don't know if I'm going to be able to do this with one hand, but basically you hold the Amiga keys and the control for five seconds and then I should hear a beep and then it will restart and then it should then designate this as the first floppy drive and it will boot from whatever's in there. Alright, so I know it's kind of a weird angle but we should be able to see everything we need to see. So I am going to hold in the 2A Amiga keys and control about five seconds. We should hear a beep and then it should restart and then that will switch the uh, floppy drive number one, or well, number zero, I believe, back to the internal drive. And then it should boot into the diagnostic disk I have in there. So let's try it out. Okay, I heard the beep. I don't know. It's not super loud. Uh, it is resetting. So there was a beep. And then it should... Yep, I can hear it. So I mean... It Seem there, yep, there we go. So there's the Amiga test kit uh, 1.2. And so it seems to be doing what it needs to. Let me hit F3 is floppy drive. Um, huh. So that might, it says floppy IDs, DF0, and then it says DF1, there is no, but then it says DF2. Um, and it is detecting something on DF2. So I'm just curious. Huh. DF0 selected. Well, that's interesting. I wonder if that has something to do with it because. Uh, hmm. I'm not sure. Um, okay, so we know that's working. So let's try this again. Let me hold down. Okay, and there's a beep. Well, it was two beeps that time. And then it should try to boot from the external floppy drive. And it is, I can hear it making the sounds. Um, but it's, I, I can, I'm looking at the display for reading the tracks and it's not, it's making sounds, but it's not really reading from any of the tracks. And then I can see the activity light for the hard drive. So uh, it seems to be now uh, failing to boot from the external floppy drive, so now it is uh, going to load up Workbench from my uh, hard drive. So, uh, I, I now, looking at that diagnostic, now I have a feeling that there, there's some kind of setting maybe on the floppy emulator I have to pick, because I have, people have claimed this has worked. Um, I think I can, so it's coming up game, this is a, the, um, the image I have is elite and then if I do it seems to depend on the image if it will read it or not so this it will see it I can open the disk and I can see a little icon for elite although it just calls it game 
And then I think this game will run from within Workbench, so I can double click on it theoretically, and I can let's see if it uh, let's see if it will run Elite from the external. So right now, how it looks, how it's set up is the floppy selector seems to be working fine, but I can't boot anything from the external floppy emulator. Uh, some things I can run, it seems, from within Workbench through it, but it just won't boot, uh, which I need it to do because the Amiga has so... Yeah, okay, see, it's running. It ran through Workbench there. Um, but the problem is, uh, I would say the majority of games on the Amiga are like booter games. So if I want to keep that floppy emulator external for it to be of really much use, I need it to be able to boot from the external, uh, from the external drive, or the external connector. And I was pretty confident that it could do that, but um, I don't know. But that let me. I'm gonna try something else. Someone else in my comments when I did my Amiga 2000 video said they had something else too, where they held the two buttons on the mouse and then they could designate which was the initial drive. Let me see if that works. So, uh, first I'll just try, and then I'll hold these. See if it does anything. Okay, look, we get a Amiga early startup control. Again, sorry this is at a weird angle. Um, there's stuff behind me. I, again, I haven't finished cleaning up this room yet. So I have boot options. I wonder if that... Oh, I can select um, things. Like select boot, boot device. DF2. And I think that's the problem because I think we want... Let me see. I think we want, for that selector to work, I think we want DF2 to actually be DF1. I don't know. Let's try this. Now, Elite's still in there, but let's see if it will boot. Oh, no. No, I don't think so. It looked like it was going to for a moment. Oh, maybe it is. Well, we might have a breakthrough here. Do, 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 do. I can see it. It's, it's actually searching through tracks. Um, this isn't the most, going into that boot loader thing isn't the most elegant solution, um, but, huh, interesting. It, this might work. Oh, oh, I got it to work. Okay, so going into the boot menu works. Hmm, interesting. Well, at least I have a way to do it now. Um, so that's nice. Um... And I suppose the, the kickstart, I wonder what, okay, let me try it though, let me try the thing. I wonder if it will override whatever you set on that. Or I wonder if you set that thing like I just set it, if that will override the uh, floppy selector. And I think, nope, okay, so that will still work. So, okay, so I can... I, that kind of works, uh, for now at least. I can have the external drive set as the boot device, and then if I want a quick way to get back to the internal drive, I can do the uh, switcher. But, let me, just, let me just see something here. Let me see if that weirdly fixed the problem. But I get the feeling now it will not boot from that... Um, from the external drive. I'm going to have to go back into that thing. Let me see. It's making the noises, but... Okay. Yeah, it looks like if I want the external drive to be my boot device... Yeah, I think it's going into the hard drive. I'm going to have to go into that selector and set it. Um, but that's, a, that's okay. If that's not, like, optimal for me. But at least it gives me something for right now. Um, I'm guessing, though, part of the problem is that external drive is being detected as DF2, and I need it to be detected as DF1, and I'm not sure if that's possible on the Amiga 2000. Uh, it might be on the Amiga 5000, where there isn't 
a second internal drive expected. Um, but that's something. Okay, well, we made progress. If anyone knows, has a fix for that, uh, has an idea what maybe I should do to correct that issue, uh, let me know. I don't think it's that... Hmm, maybe I should try putting closing that jumper on the board, but I don't know. Anyways, yeah, so it, it kind of works. Okay, that we'll count that as a success. Actually, now that I've been experimenting with it a little bit, it doesn't actually seem like a great uh, solution either because if I reset and I hold it down and then I select it as the boot device, it will boot from whatever I initially have select. So let's say I have Elite set up on there. It will then boot from the external drive into Elite. But then, if sometime during gameplay I decide to switch it to something else, like Fernandez Must Die, and then I do a soft reset, uh, or any kind of reset, it, then it will not boot from it. So basically, if I want to boot anything from the external drive, I have to, uh, if I'm power cycling, I must do the holding down the buttons and selecting the external as the boot device. Uh, I mean, that's not horrible, it's serviceable, but it's, it's really not a great solution for me. Um, so, I don't know. I, I'm going to call this like a partial work. I'm going to leave that selector in, though. That can still be useful, and if it's not really hurting anything being in there. Um, so, yeah, I'm going to call this a partial victory. Um, so... But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep working on the issue. Again, if, if any of you guys know, uh, let me know in the comment section what's, what's going on here and what's a, a solution, or is there no solution? And it's just I'm just going to have to, what I got now is the best it's going to be uh, if I want this guy to be external. So let me know. So the next thing I want to upgrade is the memory. Uh, so with the Amiga 2000 as it is, uh, the most I can put in there, I think without major modifications, would be about 8 megabytes of fast RAM. Uh, I think there's a 1 megabyte of chip RAM, and then, you know, we can upgrade our fast RAM. Now, currently I do have uh, 8 megabytes on that GVP card, but uh, as we'll see uh, in the video, that card, again, has incompatibilities with certain other cards, and I would really like to replace it. Uh, with something else. Uh, so I need a separate memory solution so I'm not dependent on that memory on that G, uh, GVP card. And as I said earlier, yeah, I did kind of poke at people that put ludicrous amounts of memory into an Amiga. Uh, admittedly, I don't think as far as games go on an Amiga 2000 you'd ever really need 8 megabytes of fast RAM, but uh, that is the max amount that this machine can, like, natively uh, take. When I'm talking about ludicrous amounts uh, on an Amiga, I'm talking about, like, 64-plus uh, megabytes on an Amiga. Uh, but I guess if you've already got a vampire or some kind of super accelerator, and you're playing, like, Doom clones or something, I suppose then maybe you need that much RAM. But, again, that is not the vision for this machine, so we're just going to go with 8 megabytes. And this was my first attempt at doing that memory upgrade. And this is a um, gotta go fast RAM. And what this does is this installs in the CPU socket. So you remove the CPU, you install this, and then you install the CPU uh, on top of it. And um, let's see, there's different little options here. Obviously if you haven't picked it up by now, uh, I'm shooting this part of the video after the fact, so I've already tried to install this. And uh, it just didn't work out. Uh, it just wasn't being detected, and I was getting errors. And I don't think it's the fault of this gotta go fast RAM module. Uh, I think, again, it was that uh, GVP uh, card, because I still had that card installed at the time, even though I removed the memory and I set the jumpers on that card to have zero memory. It was still caught. I think that was the issue. It was still causing issues. This thing just wasn't working. I wasn't thrilled about the whole fact that this kind of sits between in the socket with the CPU, too. Uh, I also heard that these pins could kind of stretch the... Uh, the socket on the board, and some things like that. I, I didn't, you know, I put it in, it didn't work, I removed it. Uh, I decided to find a different solution for memory. So unfortunately the gotta go RAM uh, didn't really work out. I'm not really sure what the hang-up was. Uh, I know this is really meant for an Amiga 500, 
but again, it did say it was compatible with the 2000. I'm just not sure why it was not detecting the uh, memory on this thing. So uh, I'm going to put this aside for now because there actually is what's probably a better option. And it, it's probably the option I should have went with in the first place. But it is a little more expensive. And that is this guy right here. This is the Zoram A2000. This is specifically for the Amiga 2000. Uh, and it simply slots into a free Zorro slot. Uh, or I think these are Zorro 2 slots on the Amiga 2000. Not sure. But uh, yeah, it should be as simple as that. I just put it in one of these free slots and it should work. Uh, you can select here by jumper. No RAM. 4 megabytes, 5.5 and 8. We're going to set it for 8. And uh, that should be it. Just make sure it's oriented correctly. I think that might be the RAM chip there, and that might be like control and stuff. I'm I'm not 100% sure. Uh, I did reinstall the SCSI card uh, just as kind of like a failsafe here. I have deactivated this RAM via the jumpers, and I have confirmed that with uh, this guy here with his uh, Mega test kit, and I have confirmed. It is not detecting the 8 megabytes of RAM. So, theoretically, all I should have to do is install this, and the SD card will still work as a hard drive, and I should have my 8 megabytes of RAM. Of course, I do plan on replacing this guy with the Buddha, um, but for now, this should work fine. Uh, this should, this might be a better option, anyways. Um, I don't really need the extra slots there. And I don't know if this memory would be faster than this memory, but I'm sure it's probably more reliable and uh, probably less prone to errors since this is just a lot of old random memory sticks. Um, now, yeah, we are slowly chugging along and replacing, uh, well, not necessarily replacing, but adding more modern components. So our percentage of you know original Amiga to uh, newer Amiga stuff uh, is going up, but I think the heart and soul of this machine is still there. I'm still using the original CPU. Um, I'm still using, I haven't messed with the video or the graphics. I, I know there's options to put in like HDMI even, uh, but I want to stick with my original video and an original CRT RGB monitor. So again, motherboard still original, so I think we still have the heart and soul of this machine. Uh, we're just doing a little, con some more convenient upgrades here. So I'm going to install this and then we'll see if it's detected. All right, so I'm going to power it up and then we're going to see uh, what we get. It should pretty quickly start loading from the disk. Huh. Nothing's happening. Okay, that's weird. So now I got uh, this error. This did not happen before when the card was removed. So obviously there's some sort of issue still going on. Uh, that's unusual. <laughs> because before it just... Okay, maybe I can have these both in. Maybe they are conflicting. Even though the RAM or the memory is disabled, it, maybe it's still conflicting. That's stupid. Ugh. Let's try this again. Alright, and it appears to be working. I know this probably isn't the best practice to just lay this on top there, but I just wanted to show it is, uh, you know, removed from the Amiga 2000. And as you can see here, we're getting 9 megabytes total. One chip, 8 fast. And there is our uh, Zorro memory card. So it, it seems that everything is working. It's just this thing is incredibly picky with what it is, uh, its fellow cards in the Amiga. So, which is again one of the reasons I would to replace it. So, um, I guess the next step now is to get the Buddha installed and then uh, install the OS to like a compact flash or a hard drive on the Buddha. And uh, hopefully there's no conflicts with that. And then uh, we'll go on if that turns out good, and we're booting from the Buddha, and uh, you know we have a hard drive back. Then we can go to the next step. If that doesn't work out, I'm just gonna have to go back to uh, this guy here. So we'll see. So this is the card I recently acquired. So this is a Buddha card. Basically, this is a hard drive solution for the Amiga, and it is an IDE controller, as you can see. 
uh, much, much smaller and more compact. Of course, this is a period correct card here. Uh, this is kind of a newer uh, component that's been, been made for the Amiga uh, in fairly recent years. Uh, production of these seems to go on and off. I actually got this uh, from a friend. It, it seemed like it was out of uh, stock in the usual places. The main reason I wanted to do this swap is because this card tends to be a little bit incompatible with a certain accelerator I wanted to try putting in this machine. Um, so a lot of things I've read, it will cause different issues, but this will not cause issues. And I don't think there's much of a speed difference. I know the SCSI and the SD card might be a little bit quicker than this guy, but I don't think it will be really enough to notice. Uh, so right now there's a module on here. I forget what these are called. DOMs. Uh, something on disk on module. So this is kind of like a compact flash card. You can you can actually connect a regular hard drive or a regular compact flash card to this. I think right now I'm just going to use this guy here. I don't know what to expect installing this. Uh, I think I think the OS is already on there, or when it boots up, it should give like a, an installation option. Maybe if it boots up. Alright, so a little bit of time has passed and I finally got in the parts I needed. And I got this thing here. Usually I get the strictly internal type, but this one, uh, it can, I can set it up right here so I can access it from uh, without taking the lid off the case. I, found, I figure that might be pretty beneficial with this build. Got my CF card. It is a 2 gigabyte industrial type uh, sand disk. Uh, I'm, I don't know, I'm not quite sure if the industrial ones are that much better. Uh, I assume they would be. SanDisk is usually a pretty short bet. I've pre-formatted it, FAT32, I think that's how you're supposed to format it. So, so hopefully I just power this thing up, the Buddha will take over, and then it will install the OS on the car, and then we'll be good to go. But uh, I get the feeling it won't be that easy. Uh, it never is, even though it should be, but... Uh, let's, uh, we'll find out. So after a lot of fiddling around, I actually had to disconnect the external drive. For some reason, no matter what I would do, it would keep trying to boot f from the external drive. Um, different cables, too. I, I initially had a 80-pin IDE cable, uh, and, and it just wasn't detecting anything whatsoever. Um, it wasn't even seeing the Buddha card. So I switched to like an older style IDE cable and now it was seeing the Buddha card. And finally I've got it where it looks like it's seeing things. There's the SanDisk 2 gigabyte, and then it also ooh, see, sees the Buddha install module. Um, so I'm going to attempt to install the OS and hopefully everything's good. Alright, looks like that was successful. I ran the install. Uh, I have watched some videos where there was one gentleman and he said he actually doesn't like to run the install from the, the Buddha module because it installs too fast, but, uh, you know, I rolled the dice there, I just installed it from the, the Buddha, the uh, DOM module onto the CF card, and then I rebooted the machine, and it seems to have went into OS 3.1. Um, I can't tell if it was, it may, it seemed like it loaded up maybe slightly slower than when I was using the, uh, the other controller and the SD card, but I don't, I don't know what we got on here. Let me just confirm that our memory's working. Yep, there we go, so we've got the full memory. So this should be a lot more stable with that, that newer kind of memory module here. I'm not using a hodgepodge of, uh, of memory on that SCSI controller, and... You know, that JVP SCSI controller, it's pretty cool, uh, but it does have some incompatibility issues with other cards, so um, hopefully the Buddha is a little bit better. Um, I will take improved compatibility with other expansion cards over slightly faster boot times, I guess. Um, so yeah, everything is looking good. Okay, so yeah, I mean, it's not the cleanest Still got this big old cord that I didn't have before. But I've set it in place. I've got it all hooked up. So the LED is working. And yeah, after a couple cycles and reboots, it actually does seem just as fast as the SD card, if not a little faster, maybe. So um, I don't know. Now that I've seen it boot a couple times, yeah, I don't. I don't really think there's much of a difference. So 
Okay, everything whew, everything seems to be working uh, pretty good now. Uh, I tried switching, you know, between boot with floppies, and that's still working with the switcher. Of course, uh, to, you know, I do have to do hold the two buttons there sometimes to pick that one as the boot device, but it, it is, for the most part, working. So uh, I'm very, I'm, I'm pretty happy with this uh, so far. So I've got one more uh, upgrade to do. So for the last of my tasteful upgrades to this Amiga 2000, I did want to put in an accelerator. Now, yes, there's a lot of modern, crazy fast accelerators. Uh, you know, there's the Vampire, there's all oh, terrible fire. I don't know if they make that one for the the Amiga 2000, but there's just there's just a ton of more modern accelerators. There's like a, a Raspberry Pi thing that you can hook up. Um, I think I mentioned earlier, it's it's just crazy. You can get basically any of the Amigas to ridiculous speeds. Um, and generally that's not too much of a problem, but I really wanted to focus on compatibility with this Amiga 2000. I didn't want to stray too far uh, from the base model. And I also wanted like a switch to fall back on the original processors. And a lot, like the vast majority of accelerators for the Amiga do not have switches. You You install it and that's the speed it runs at. But I did pick up this guy some time ago. This is a uh, Supra Turbo. This was an accelerator. Uh, they made it for the Amiga 500 and the 2000. The only difference I think for the Amiga 500, it's like in a case and it connects to to the side uh, port on the Amiga 500. Um, for the Amiga 2000, it's basically the same thing without the case. Uh, this is vintage from around 1993. Uh, the thing I like about this, now it's there's no label on there, and it doesn't strike me right away. I don't remember exactly what speed this is, but this is, I believe, like a low-power Hitachi clone of the uh, Motorola 68K, uh, so the same one that's in the Amiga 2000 and 500, and it's just running at a much higher speed but it is since it's still like the same processor basically with the same code and everything um, there shouldn't be any compatibility issues so it's basically like kinda like the what the NEC V20 is kinda to the 8088 but not really because I believe they added code to that processor I think this is basically the same processor uh, just low power and just sped up massively. I want to say it's like 25 megahertz maybe? Um, but yeah, so uh, maybe that will give me enough speed for some of those games that might not play that well. Remember, the Amiga 2000 is not an AGA system, so I'm not going to be able to run like any crazy advanced games that need crazy accelerators or really fast CPUs or anything, but uh, my main purpose for an accelerator was really to make playing something like WHD load um, using that on the Amiga a little easier. So uh, I grabbed this guy. The second main benefit of this is I believe you can put a switch on there. Now I'm not sure. We've got one that says boot, uh, boot, machine, and option. And I believe you can connect a switch to one of these uh, so you can switch this thing on and off uh, at will. Now, I did get this at a little discount because this was tested working, so this should be working, but this guy right here is blown out. I don't know if you can see that well, um, but it's, yeah, it's burnt out. It's destroyed, but uh, it, it seems to still work. I did some asking around on, like, Amiga forums and uh, Amiga fan groups and stuff, and I was told... This doesn't really need that to be working. This is some kind of like a filter transistor or filter capacitor or something like that. So uh, it might make it work a little better. It might help with like the signal quality or something. I don't know. I'm not really technical. But for this to operate, this doesn't really need to be uh, functional. So we'll see. Uh, I will install it. This installs oops, in that processor slot right there. And... Um, We'll see if it works. The other option I was looking at was the Spitfire. Again, that's another little accelerator, mainly for the Amiga 500, but it's been shown to work in the, the 2000, or at least most 2000 models. I think it's, it's almost like the Sprint Express for the old IBM PC. And it's just a little thing. It goes under your CPU, and uh, I 
I think there's a switch with that too. And it just clock doubles. It just doubles the speed. I think from like 7 megahertz to 14-ish megahertz. So that was another option I was looking at. So maybe I'll have to try that if this accelerator doesn't work. So so the first thing I'm going to do is try this. Now that other program I used was is pretty good for diagnostics, but it doesn't tell us CPU speed. At least not that I could see. But this is Sysinfo 4.4. I think this is the latest version. Um, I should be able to just, it should boot from this and it should give us some uh, some different information and it should tell us our CPU speed. So first we'll do this without the accelerator, then I'll install the accelerator and then we'll see what it says. Alright, so here we are and I did run the speed test and as you can see it's about right as lining up with the A2000 6800 at 7 megahertz. Uh, one, I think that means like a one-to-one -one ratio, so it's it's running exactly how you would expect it to. It's running at 7 megahertz with the 6800. Um, there's just some other miscellaneous info over here. Yeah, our CPU 6800 at 7.16. Um, I don't know why it... I don't know why it says we're in PAL mode, though. I mean, obviously this machine is not in PAL mode, but... Um, Okay, uh, so uh, I guess at this point I will install the accelerator and then we will run this again and see what happens. Alright, so we're installed. Um, I don't think there's any software I have to install. I mean, I, I think there is software for this, uh, but it's more for like other operation. I think, I think just for it to work on the most basic level, I don't have to install any software. Um, so... Uh, we'll see. It looks like it's in there pretty good. The one thing I don't like is that the jumpers are on the underside. So if I have to adjust something, I basically have to pull it out again. Um, so let's hit power and uh, see if anything happens. Uh, da -da -da. Okay, I hear it. So we'll see what it says. Okay, uh, it does look like it is functioning here. Um, I was off with the speed. Uh, it's, at least according to this, is actually running at almost uh, 30 megahertz, so 28.90 megahertz. It's just being detected as a 6800. That makes sense. And um, I think our number last time, our standard number was like 712 or 700 and something. So that's a significant bump. We're we're running faster than an A1200 um, with the 68020 at 14 megahertz um, so obviously it's an older it's still a 6800 it's not these later uh, 68020s or 68030s or 40s so clock for clock uh, these are still going to be faster but at 30 megahertz right now we are uh, well we're not quite as fast as the 6830 running at 25 megahertz obviously but we're pretty close it's almost there that's that is a a uh, really nice speed bump so um, that is that's that's nice so <laughs> um, I don't know what I'm gonna do about that I don't know if it's a cap or a transistor or something I uh, I might have that replaced just to have it replaced just so I know everything's working tip-top here on this but um, yeah that's nice now I just have to figure out how to put a switch on there and then we should be good to go but that is a nice little speed increase there so and uh, it shouldn't sacrifice any kind of compatibility or anything like that. I, I also might uh, put a little heat sink on the CPU. I don't think it needs it but um, never be too careful with cooling. Yeah after uh, looking up the manual you can find it online. Uh, it did state that that little jumper there that's labeled as boot that is the uh, jumper for enabling or disabling the uh, CPU there so so I can just hook up a simple switch on there and uh, turn it on and off just like I do with the uh, kickstart ROM uh, the one thing though with the switch it can only be uh, you know at boot so at boot you know you switch it if you want it to run at the uh, stock with like 7 megahertz or if you want it running at the what is it 28 to 30 megahertz of this CPU on on this card uh, but during operation uh, I do not believe you are supposed to use the switch. I don't know what will happen if you use it during uh, operation. I assume the computer will just lock up or something. Um, but I don't know if it will potentially damage anything. Now there is software for this uh, accelerator card, which I do not have. 
Uh, I might be able to find it online. And the software actually lets you switch speeds uh, during operation. So you would run the you would run the software in like Workbench, and then you could change the CPU speed uh, within Workbench via software. But yeah, there is the uh, switch option, which is nice. It's one of the main reasons I was on the lookout for uh, this particular accelerator. All right, so I have a little switch I cobbled together, so hopefully that will work to uh, enable and disable the accelerator. I also put a little heat sink, a little copper heat sink on there. Uh, with like a thermal pad, sticky pad. Um, I don't know, it might actually bump that chip down there, so I don't know if it will fit with this thing on. It doesn't need it, but, you know, it's always nice to do some extra um, cooling if you can. So, uh, I'll try installing that. If it if it hits something and it just does, it can't install with, I'll just take it off. It's not a big deal. Alright, looks like the switch works. Um, I was going to actually install the switch right here above the Kickstart ROM switcher switch, but actually my drill died trying to drill through this piece of metal. Um, so I'm just kind of having it hang out in the back here. But uh, yeah, it is right now it is showing um, just standard speed. Um, yeah, 7.16 megahertz. Uh, so I'm going to turn it off, flip the switch, and then we will uh, power back on again and see if we get the, the boost if the switch is working. Yeah, all right, cool. I turned it off and flipped the switch and powered it back on. And uh, yeah, now we're getting the 28.90 megahertz. So yeah, it's definitely working. So uh, nice. All right, so that about wraps things up for this video. <laughs> Excuse the noise. I'm actually trying to load this game up from an actual uh, disc. Uh, I, I picked this game up, Carrier Command. I used to play it as a kid a lot, and it like mystified me as a kid. And I actually found the disc, the boxed game, at a uh, thrift store. Actually, you know, right here. I actually found it in the wild at a thrift store, but I wanted to see if the actual disc in there worked. But anyways, yeah, I'm pretty happy with this machine. Um, it's kind of where I want it to be. There, there's still some things that could be better, um, like the whole you know, if I want to boot from the external drive, I have to restart and, like, hold down the mouse and go through all that rigmarole. But, I mean, at least I can do it, and it usually works. Um, hmm, this has taken a long time. It might not actually be reading it. But anyways, um, or the disc might not be good. Um, but anyways, it's mostly, despite a few quirks, um, I think it's mostly where I want it now. And uh, as I started this video out, I think they are sort of... Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't think that's actually. Yeah, I think that disc might be corrupt. Eh. Anyways, maybe not. Maybe I just needed it to run longer. But, um, nah. okay. But anyways, as I said at the beginning of this video, uh, I think they're tasteful upgrades. I think it keeps the spirit of the Amiga and what the Amiga is. And again, I want to stress, I have nothing against, I have no beef with people that, you know, pimp these things out to outrageous degrees, but I, I just think it gets to a point where it's like not even an Amiga anymore. I mean, when you put in an accelerator and it's literally like a hundred times more powerful than what it was, it's just, I don't know, and then you're outputting dig, like to HDMI, to an LC, it's, it's, I know it's convenient, but it's, I don't know. To me, it's like basically, it's not even an Amiga anymore. It's just an emulator, uh, maybe in an Amiga case. I mean, you might have like a custom case too. And again, nothing wrong with that. That's just definitely not the direction I wanted to take. So uh, I think I achieved my goal of upgrading this Amiga 2000, keeping the essence of what the Amiga 2000 is, uh, while adding a lot of convenience. Uh, I would like to run WHD load on this machine. Um, I know that's more meant for a little bit more powerful systems, but maybe with that accelerator it won't be so difficult to do. Uh, but yeah, that's uh, my Amiga 2000. Uh, tasteful upgrades. Let me know what you think in the comments, and uh, I hope you enjoyed this video, and I will see you in the next one.